So we stick 100,000 gallons of Chena River water in that dry dock, sink it down, put the boat on top, and then we pump out the water. And the boat comes up just like an elevator. So that is a one-of-a-kind dry dock. You will notice our wonderful staff and their heartfelt goodbye until lunchtime. <laughs> Even a young lady in a parka. Over here on the right boat, so we put out discovery number two. Then in the second in our boat, that will take passenger service by Captain Lee Baker in 1987, which is the very same ship. So we're actually, we still take that every single day when the boat comes to rest. We both have the orange paddle in the back. This is an authentic survey. This is going to be like a robot shore, and somebody physically pulls you around. So we are using a thruster to make this quick turn. That's why it's quite nice to pull the power over here in Alaska. We're going to get the engineering tank over here in Alabama. As the boat get off Fouts Field in that plane, 150 feet, and he's in the air. Our pilots are very skilled. They have to get in and out of very tight spots in Alaska. The only trick when he comes back to land is to avoid our boat there, as you can see. All right, to watch the video, Tim's got a good shot of him. Now you can see him in front of the boat. What Steve has to do here, folks, is called a slip turn. It's a controlled fall. He's going to turn very sharp to the left. He has to point his nose down and see where the river is so he knows where he's headed. Very tricky maneuver with heavy crosswinds, as you can imagine. Comes in, makes a steep left bank turn. And watch the little bit of hang time here. And then both floats. Beautiful landing. Wonderful. <laughs> That's our good friend Steve, everybody. And in just a moment, I'm going to radio in so you can actually meet Steve. I'll introduce him to you in just a moment here, folks. Captain, that you got a pilot's license before you even got a driver's license. Is that true? Yes, I was uh, raised out on the Yukon River out in western Alaska. I've been uh, flying these aircraft since I was a teenager. My dad was a pilot and instructor. Also had uh, sled dogs out on the Yukon for transportation and tried my hand at the Iditarod race in 1980. Then in 91, I moved to Fairbanks here and became an aircraft mechanic. So now when I'm not flying these aircraft, I'm working on them full time, keeping them in the air. Now, Steve, tell us about this airplane you're flying today. That's your aircraft. I think it's a 1951. It's vintage, and it's a Piper Super Cub. But when you found this plane, it did not look this good, did it? No, I acquired this aircraft about 20 years ago. It had brush and weeds growing up around it. I uh, took it all apart, totally restored it, put it back in the air, and have accumulated over 2,000 hours in it around the state. So it's, it's taken me uh, quite a few places around Alaska. Oh, look at that. It's always nice when Steve drops in to see us here on the boat. They wanted to mine for gold outside of the city area. Californians brought this idea with them of using high pressure water to mine for gold. That's called hydraulic placer mining. inside their home during the summer months. The, the real beauty is anytime you get to play with puppies here, it's a great day. You know, Dave, you get to see some of the sweetest faces in the world in those little puppy faces. Tell us how old those guys are. Well, these guys are about six weeks old now, and they're at an incredibly uh, fun stage in their life because they, they, they know us and they trust us since birth, and you can see how excited they are to follow Ava around, and you can see even how they jumped over the log there. Well, that's something we do purposely. We put challenges in their way to help them develop self-confidence. Now, for example, it was this log at first, maybe it was jumping on the dock next, or going through the water. Now, every time they can't make it through those obstacles, we help them across. But when they finally do make it, 
we always praise them on the other side, and they learn something important from that. They learn that we'll never ask them to do anything that's impossible for them, but also that we'll always be there to help them if the going gets tough, and that really pays dividends when we're out on the trail together with them later on in life. So we'll go on a walk. Now, Kivy will run way in front of us down the trail. Then all of a sudden, with the puppies chasing her, she'll duck off into the trees and go through brush and down ravines, through the water, whatever they encounter, she goes through it, and the puppies chase her. And when they've been out of my sight for a while, kind of playing out there, then I call Kivy back, and she runs to me immediately, and the pups chase her back. And by doing that, many times the puppies start developing two different skills. Number one, the skill is listen for my voice, because they need that when we start teaching them commands. But second, and by far the most important, is they learn to always follow that lead dog, because that's the dog that will bring them safely home, and they need that skill when they go in harness for the first time. Dan, tell us about the harness, because that's a big part of the dog's life. What are you looking for, and what's your measuring stick when you put them in a harness? Well, you know, uh, what we do when I choose to put them in harness for the first time, it's not just a date. Usually it happens at about six months old, uh, because that's when they become physically mature, big enough, strong enough, and fast enough. But I like to look inside each puppy to make sure they're ready to succeed. They have a good run at first, and something they want to do again. So what's required is that the instinct to pull has to have kicked in. Now with these guys right here, you can see how enthusiastic they are. Now it's not me making them go forward, it's them wanting to go forward for the sheer joy of, of running and working with their partners. Now, I've got great lead dogs out in front, but if I was doing puppies right now, I would need them out for sure because uh, if you put only puppies in a team with no leaders, it would be like a first grade class with no teacher. It would be total pandemonium. So each dog behind provides power, and uh, the power is actually, is actually uh, increases, of course, as you put different t uh, amounts of dogs in a team. Now, I might have 20 dogs in a team sometimes, and that means that my, uh, my team would be over 100 feet long, so you can imagine how essential it is that I rely on great leaders up front, and uh, also how important it is that I have a machine that I can control. Now, I don't need power, and as you can see, I've removed the engine here because uh, I don't need anything more to go forward. But number two, I've reinforced these brakes, and you can see me standing on them right now, trying to trying to keep this mob under control. And they're pretty they're pretty rowdy today. Uh, I expect to have almost a record time. And uh, if it wasn't for the fact that I'm tied off to this rope here right now, I'd be skidding out of the gate already. So I'm going to take off, and I'll call you from the other side. Okay, dude. Now, folks, watch how fast they break away here. There's 10 dogs, and they are pulling 600 pounds. A lot of folks wonder if they're purebred huskies because they notice that they're a little smaller. These are not purebred dogs. They're mixed intentionally for their long-distance running ability, their stamina, and their speed. So they're not purebreds. And you'll notice when they break over to the other side of the lake, they're going to be running very fast. Now, put yourself in Dave's shoes for a moment. March, 2030 below for a thousand miles. Okay, right now it's sunny, but imagine winter time. It's a very grueling sport. Well, here we come out of the trees and into the straightaway. And I love these morning runs because it's nice and cool in the shade over here. And the lead dogs are setting a pace that every dog behind them is wanting to follow. And this team looks very well matched. Everybody's doing the exact same amount of work. And that's why we can sustain the speed of almost 20 miles an hour right now, which is remarkable when you consider that the four-wheeler and I weigh over 600 pounds together. And we're, we're moving along like nothing. Now these guys are also have to be trained to go the distance. And they may actually uh, go up to 100 miles every day when we're racing. I have to give them a command and I'll talk to you when I get back. Whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa is not their favorite word either. Folks, that's Dave Monson and those beautiful dogs. Isn't that great? Well, thank you very much. You know, And uh, these guys are the ones
guys that I really like to give the praise to because they work so hard every time we go out for a run. So we want to say thank you to them. And then, of course, after work, like us, it's time for play. And the dogs are no different. They're not. In fact, they're, they're so much like the puppies, just bigger, Dave. What a nice life they have. Yeah, can you imagine going running with your best friends and coming home, going for a swim, getting the best nutrition year-round, have somebody else feeding it to you? Uh, <laughs> I want that life. <laughs> I'm telling you, though, it's like you said, trust and be trusted. They work hard for you. They sure deserve it. And, Dave, it's always nice to see you and these dogs. And we're going to head up to the Gina Village, as you know, and, and we love it when you make time in your schedule to come up and visit with folks on the boats. Do you have some time this morning to do that? Well, absolutely. I'm going to be up there uh, just a little bit after the boat lands. I'll, uh, if you want to stop by, I'll be in a cabin. Uh, there's a, the way you can identify it, there's a, a beautiful bronze statue of our lead dog, Granite, out in front. If you've got questions, stop by. I'd love to try and answer them. Also, Ava Lindner, right over there, is going to bring some dogs down, and you'll be able to get up close and pet them if you like. They won't be all wet like these guys. They'll be nice and dry. Dog salmon. And when we come back up river, Hannah, what will you do for us with that chum salmon? When you folks come back up, I'll show you how we cut this and turn it to dog food. Thank you, Hannah. You can see the fish wheel down there on shore. We'll teach you all about life at fish camp. Again, folks, this will be a highlight when we stop here at the Gina Indian Village. Thanks, Hannah. We'll see you shortly. Folks, let me pause here and teach you about these amazing animals that are known as Rangifer tyrannus. Now, Rangifer tyrannus is an excellent descriptor, actually, because they range fur all over the tyrannus about 2,000 miles a year. Every time we come by here, folks, their antlers are bigger and getting more full. And pretty soon, all the velvet's going to rub off these antlers, and what you'll find underneath is a beautiful chocolate brown hair. Oh, yeah. silk. Tons and tons of it in suspension. So look at this cream in your coffee color that you get where these two rivers meet. It's really amazing. In fact, this river changes daily. Last week, we had a huge sandbar in front of us. People were laying in the sun on that sandbar, but the river changes constantly. Captain Ken, you've seen a lot of changes in this very unpredictable Tanana River, isn't that right? It's amazing how much this river changes. You know, it's a braided river, and as Jim mentioned, uh, there was a big island down here not too long ago that actually only formed about three years ago. That island's big enough for a team that has to land and sit with the on the ocean. Actually changed the most drastic change. It used to be 50 feet in front of us. Thousand fish a day with a salmon fish wheel. It's pretty amazing. It was the man's job traditionally to build and maintain these, repair them. It was the woman's job to take the salmon, cut it, smoke it, and prepare it for their families and for their dogs. Now, how do you control the population? Well, the government comes along and regulates the use. You can't have them on 24 hours a day. You've got to shut them down sometimes. And that's how you control the salmon population. Let me reintroduce you to, on show again, on to your left, folks, our good friend, Hannah. Good morning, Hannah. Shumai, hello. As Jim would say, my name is Hannah. My mother's family is Yupik, Eskimo, and Athabascan Indian from the village of McGrath. McGrath is on the Cuscoquim River, about 330 miles southwest of here. And when my mom was little, she'd be packed up into the boat. They would travel to my family's fish camp. They learned a lot of traditional skills, including how to cut fish, beadwork skills, skin sewing skills, storytelling skills. Unfortunately, they've closed fishing on the Cusco Home River, so I can't go to fish camp today. But uh, they still know how to do it, and I've learned since I was little. Pretty amazing family traditions, too, uh, Hannah. And tell us about the fish camp behind you. What are the buildings used for? Actually, this camp is very similar to what you would see if you were going along the Tana or the Yukon River. And down in the water, we have a fish wheel. It's a very efficient way of catching the salmon. And then we always have our air drying racks, like they, these two you can see up sh on shore. There's the covered one for rainy days, but on a beautiful day like today, I'll use this one right next to me. And then directly behind me is the smokehouse. We smoke to preserve our salmon. And next we smoke our salmon to preserve it. And next to it on the cache is a... Next to it on the stilts is a cache, excuse me. And that helps keep our food and supplies up off the ground away from the animals. And there's cameras.
and the small tents over there. I know they don't look like much, but they're very cozy because you can build a fire right inside. And then dogs are set up in houses like you can see, and they're always put along the perimeter of camp because they'll act as an alarm system in case any bears try to come in the area. That's good planning. You don't want a bear sticking their nose in there without the dogs telling you. And tell us about the chum salmon down there, Anna. We get two runs of chum every year, mm -hmm. uh, of course. And what do you use it for? Tell us about that. Well, we do get five species of salmon in Alaska. Of them, chum is the least quality, so it's fed to the dogs. Other salmon, like the king, sockeye, and silver, are cut for people. What I did here is the dog food cut. It's a very easy cut to do. You learn it when you're a young girl. You take your knife, and I use an ulu. You cut along the backbone of the salmon. That's to separate the fillets from the backbone and the head. Next thing I'm going to do is cut the backbone off. And as you'll be learning, nothing is ever wasted. So the backbone will actually be boiled down and the soft parts are fed to the dogs. If this was a high quality salmon, we'd cut the head off and make fish head soup, which is considered a delicacy. A delicacy, fish head soup. It's a delicacy for who? It's for the elders. Oh, okay. I, I must be honest, I'm not an elder yet, and I've never tried fish head soup. Can you uh, tell us what it tastes like, Anna? I don't know. I'm not old enough. <laughs> <laughs> you have that to look forward to, I guess. All right, you've got your ulu, and what are you doing now to the salmon, Anna? Right now, I'm scoring the salmon, so when you hang it up to air dry, it opens the salmon up. It has more surface area, so it dries quicker. And now you put that in the smokehouse, is that right? No, we don't like to put wet, drippy salmon like this directly in the smokehouse. There's too much moisture on here, it'll just mold. So what you have to do is let some of that excess moisture drip off. It'll only take a couple of hours out here on the air drying rack. And once it becomes tacky, then it's safe to rotate into the smokehouse. For dog pieces like that, we want them to be completely dehydrated. So we'll leave them in the smokehouse for up to two weeks. And tell us now what you do if you're preparing the salmon for yourselves rather than the dogs. What do you do differently? Well, for people, we like to take a little bit more care. Like I said, we'll use a different kind of salmon. And we'll cut that salmon into smaller pieces, often into strips like these. Uh, and then we'll brine them. We like to use brown sugar, salt, and honey to brine. And we smoke our salmon with the alder wood to give it a nice sweet taste. And tell us about the wood you use for the dogs. Oh, well, for dogs, we'll use spruce wood or even driftwood. They're not too picky. <laughs> just well, Hannah, thanks for your time this morning. Tell our friends what they can expect on shore. You're going to go over here to the Chena Indian Village. There's three short stops where you're going to learn a lot about the Athabascan Indian people. After the formal tour, you're going to have free time. And during that time, if you'd like, you can come over here to fish camp and I can answer more questions. Thank you so much, Hannah. We appreciate your time. We'll see you on shore. is actually quite productive and ships coal to faraway places like South Korea. Oxidized copper as well as uh, uh, maybe some iron there. It's a little rusty. Oh, that's the last. It is also a last call for the gift shop. So if you were thinking about buying something,
I'm trying to measure drops. We're talking about 700 feet or so by the river. Down. A couple drivers like to say a few bounces and several rolls. I have more. <laughs> Should talk about that. You lost the wheel. Yes, we did. Land us is there. As a pretty quickly disposition by nature, you know, neatly aggressive temperament, balanced, you know, with good survival instinct. But, you know, they're so powerful, I and mean, they could take your head and their jaws and they could crush like an eggshell. Or, you know, one swipe of their powerful paw, they can crush in the side of the skull of a, you know, steer or a bison. You know, send a wolf line to the air like a ping pong ball. And, you know, yet there they are grazing like cows. Serene as could be, but... You know, grizzly bears are famously temperamental animals, though, and mood changers. <laughs> sure, you know, lightning fast mood changes. You know, so they decide to become playful, not only have ahead of us, so they come back with it. If you want more of these bears, don't get that closer. We'll see what it looks like when I get up on the big screen. We'll be back here in a couple of minutes. Forty foot long monsters. You want to go over there and tickle them? Look at our cameras. Oh, look out! Look out! Oh, look out! Oh, look out! Oh, The mountain range on our right side is still the Alaska range, but the mountains on our left are now the Talkeetna range. The 
southern and the northern. There's about five miles between them. From Fairbanks, we only see the northern peak, so it kind of looks like a melted ice cream cake from Fairbanks. But from Anchorage, it looks very pointy. There we go, there it is. in here it became a big big bird sanctuary they were originally going to turn it into a landfill to a dump but uh, there was enough resistance to that by the public that they 
turned it into a bird refuge instead. And as far as major ski resorts go, it's got the lowest base elevation of any major ski area in the world. Its base elevation is 200 feet. We'll be seeing this all along here and then on the other side when we get to the end of Turnigan Arm and turn around, there'll be a, a big mess of them there. Eagles like to hang out on them. But it looks like even the eagles are staying home today.
Conservationist the world has known, John Muir. Now what the heck was John Muir doing up here? See, I'm from Northern California. He's a pretty big deal there. He's got a hospital and a highway and a, just about everything else named after him. And we know him as a pioneer in preserving and protecting our wild places. You guys came in a cruise ship today. You guys came in Gas No Channel, which is this body of water in front of us. Just on the other side is Douglas Island. Douglas Island has 10% of Juno's population. Juno's population is about 33,000. We recovered over $80 million in gold. In today's economy, it would be worth $4.6 billion or more. The green moss that you see growing on the trees is known as lichen. <laughs> Where are you folks from? Uh oh, that's next. <laughs> Does anybody know who these children are? <laughs> I remember that all my yeah, all six of yeah. mine were in the box. Six children. Yes. Oh my god. We have problems for We just call it bicycle borrowing. <laughs> I lost my bike a couple a uh, couple weeks back.
you can imagine that's just about a tenth of the falls um, from what's down below. Only registering at uh, about one or two on the Richter scale. Uh, so pretty active area. Yeah. All intersecting under that bridge. So pretty crazy that bridge can just be scanned from the left side, huh? It's yeah. got a big gap on the right if it yeah. comes attached.
Thank you. 